Good morning, kind people of the internet. Today is an exciting day because today is the release of my first etude book, which is entitled Standard Etudes Volume 1. So this is the physical copy and this is the B-flat version. So we have B-flat available. We also have it available in other keys like C and E-flat and bass clef. So you don't have to, just have to be a saxophone player to be able to use this book. You can really play any instrument. And so it's going to, it's, it is available now on my website, which is seananbowden.com if you don't already know. So it's available in three different formats. You have three options for purchase. You can get it just as PDF, which will be emailed to you. You just have PDF files and you can print it out yourself or just read it off your computer or your tablet or whatever. The second option is PDF and a physical copy. So if you choose that, I will actually mail you this copy that has a binding and a nice plastic cover and a backside and all of the pages printed out in here. This is a nice option because you can open it up and the way the etudes are designed, you have the first page on the left and the second page on the right like that. So you don't have to worry about turning pages in the middle of it. Um, and you can leave it open. You don't have to worry about folding a book. It just kind of stays open, which is really nice. I actually really, really like the layout of this. Then the third option for purchase is PDF and physical copy. You get that and then you also get a video for that goes along with each etude. So there are 10 etudes in, in this book and I'm focusing on 10 of the most common standards. So let me turn to my table of contents here and I can just read you all the tunes that we have in the book. So we have All the Things You Are, Solar, Stella by Starlight, There Will Never Be Another You, Donna Lee, On Green Dolphin Street, Autumn Leaves, Billy's Bounce, Blue Bossa, and Stable Mates. So if you choose to get the video version, um, what I do in the videos is first I play through the entire etude on my saxophone so you can hear it. And then I do an in-depth analysis of the entire etude, looking at the harmonic structure, how it's laid out melodically and the phrasing and the rhythm. Really, I just try to dig into every detail and explain my thought process or explain what's happening. So for example, um, if I'm looking at the first etude, which is all the things you are, um, when I start the video analysis, uh, I'm just looking at the first eight measures first and break down the phrasing. I explain what I'm thinking. I look at the harmony that's, that's happening in measure three. I talk about how I'm using the altered scale, how I'm using the flat 13 and the flat and the sharp nine there. And then, I ha and then how I resolve that and then what's happening harmonically in the next four bars and how I'm using the sharp 11 sound on the major chord and sort of showing you how that works there. So what I'm also going to do at the end of this video is actually share the full video for the first etude in here, just so you can get an idea of what I'm doing with the video analysis portion of this book. Um, and then if you choose to purchase that, you will get an, another video for each individual etude. So my thought process behind this book was basically just taking the format of classical etudes. Um, you know, there are tons and tons of classical etude books that are great practice for your instrument, but not a lot in terms of actual jazz or improvisation etude books. So what I was thinking as I was writing this was basically trying to write a solo that I would be happy playing myself in a live situation. So what I did was just basically sit down with manuscript paper and try to hear a solo in my head. I wasn't even using my instrument, um, but I'm familiar enough with these tunes that I can hear the chord changes and hear lines that would work over those changes in my head. And I'm really happy with what I came up with. I think there's a lot of great material in here that you can use to enhance your own improvisation. Obviously, this is a great sight reading tool. Um, a lot of the tunes in here in, are in 4-4, four, four, but I did include one that's in 7-4, so if you're new to playing in 7, that would be good. Um, like this Stella by Starlight etude. This is actually in 7-4, and I'm thinking of it as like a straight eighth feel. Um, so what you can do is just pop up in the book and try to read it down. You can put a metronome on or you can do it with a backing track. You can turn on your own play along. Um, if you're trying to work on up tempo, for example, you could put the iReal Pro app on and I have Donnelly in here so you could 
crank up the Donna Lee play along to like a fast tempo and see if you can play along. So sight reading, obviously that will be a great practice with this book. You can also work on transposition if you're new to that or just want to get stronger at that. Um, but I think the biggest thing that you can take away from this book is um, adding new vocabulary and improv language to your own playing. If you can just open the book and go to a random measure, I bet you'll find something interesting that you might like to be able to play on your own or to be able to play in the moment while you're improvising. So that's sort of how I think about this book is just um, being able to take little snippets of the language, take it out and practice it and sort of dissect it, play it through all the keys, maybe practice it through a tune that you are working on and then let it morph its way into your own playing. I know for myself, this was definitely something that helped me a lot early on was actually writing out etudes over specific chord changes. This gave me a chance to slow the changes down really hear it and think about what I was trying to play or compose. The more that I did that, then the easier it became to improvise that way on the spot. I could sort of hear the changes, hear lines that would work, and then be able to play that way. But it took a long time of really dissecting the changes and learning little bits of language and then learning how to put them together to help connect chord changes, create phrases, and really ultimately be able to make good musical choices on the spot. Okay, so please email me if you have any questions about the book, and now I'm going to play the video demo analysis that you would get um, if you purchase that package for the book. So this is the video for just the first etude over all the things you are. And by the way, if you do purchase the video package, um, you can specify what key you want it. So I do have the videos in the different keys as well. All right, thanks. <laughs> to this analysis of the first etude of this book. And let me just say thank you for purchasing this video series. Um, I hope that you will learn a lot from it. Um, my goal is to really leave no stone unturned and really just dig into the lines here, check out the chord changes, and hopefully you will go away with a lot more than you started with. Um, I know this is one of the things that I used to do a lot in college and in our saxophone master class where I went, I went did my undergrad at IU and we would have a good 20 or 25 saxophone players in a room all examining a transcription together. And this really helps me learn a lot about theory and about language and about how to navigate chord changes and craft solos and learn different concepts and all sorts of things like that. So that's what I'm going to try to do with these etudes. So let's take a look at these first eight measures of all the things you are. And um, what I've done for these etudes overall is really just try to compose a solo that I would be happy performing. So what I've done is really craft it note by note and try to make it um, develop in a natural and musical way. 
and just make it something that I would like to hear and, and that I would like to play myself. Um, when we slow it down and compose it, it gives us a, a chance to really perfect our ideas and our concepts and our flow and, and everything. So that's what I've sort of done here. And it's interesting when I look back, looking at these first eight measures, I can really hear, especially the Stan Getz influence in my sort of thinking. Uh, and I did transcribe one of his solos on All the Things You Are. And one of the things that he really did was play long eighth note lines. So looking at these first eight bars, I've really just played two long phrases of mostly eighth notes. I think there are only two places, um, well, three if we count that last note, where I'm not playing eighth notes. Um, and that can be a really cool sound, trying to play long eighth note lines. Uh, looking at that third measure, I'm really focusing on the notes in the altered scale. So I'm hitting that flat 13, the sharp nine, and the flat nine. Um, so that would be a great thing to try to practice maybe that specific line or try to come up with your own line And then looking down in that sixth measure I'm hitting that altered sound so the altered dominant so really ignoring the two chord there But thinking about hitting the flat nine and the flat 13 of the altered chord and then when I resolve in the next measure I'm really clearly hitting that sharp 11 sound over the major chord. Okay, looking at the next eight measures, one thing that stands out to me here is this really clear use of the tritone sub. And in particular, it's the triad of the tritone sub. So if you think about whatever the dominant chord is, I'm doing a tritone away from that and then just playing the one, three, five of that tritone. So that can be a really cool sound to play right before resolving to a major chord. So in that next measure you see then, I'm really clearly hitting and outlining the one, three, five of the major chord. So then looking down in the next phrase, I'm continuing that idea of the triad and now I'm sequencing. So I'm really clearly playing three, five, one of each chord. And you can see it there through the major chord, then the two, then the five chord, and then resolving to the one chord. All right, jumping ahead to the next eight bars. The way I'm thinking about this first phrase is I'm ignoring that first two chord and really thinking those first two measures as just an altered dominant. So that entire line, I'm sort of thinking that altered flat nine, sharp nine, and flat 13 sound. And then when I resolve in the major chord, I'm really trying to get an angular sound. You see I'm jumping around there and I start sequencing this idea. And it's a cool way um, to use repetition to start with one idea and then try to move it through the chord changes. So you see in the second half of this phrase, I sort of continue that angular line and I'm moving it up through the changes and then finally resolving it in the next phrase. And then here I am actually continuing this sequence and repetition idea, but it's a different type of sequence. Um, it's this descending thing with this moving line on the top too. And then one of the things that sticks out here and that's kind of cool is that I'm hitting that flat nine color on that dominant chord in bar 27. Then this is something that I like to do a lot. Um, the two, five, one here starting on in measure 33, I'm starting with a pretty consonant note that seventh on the two chord, and then I'm using tension and release by including that flat nine on the dominant chord in bar 34. So flat nine, and then resolving down, and then resolving nicely to the major chord. All right, looking at this next phrase, this is a sort of an unusual sounding line, but I like to throw in things like this from time to time because I think it gives a nice contrast from playing a lot of eighth notes. So here you see I'm just finding that note on the top, holding it, and then changing my note on the bottom as I go through the chords to try to find interesting colors. And then looking at the next phrase, this is an interesting contrast as well because now I'm switching to just a diatonic sound of that major chord. So the major chord in bar 43, these entire four measures are just notes from that major scale. So that can be a, a good way to get um, a nice sound is, is just using one scale. That's definitely something I hear Stan Getz doing a lot. All right, looking ahead to the next phrase, the thing that I'm going for here is playing this hemiola, which is just a rhythm that is repeating but is shifting where it's placed in the measure. So what I'm doing is doing, um, if we start in measure 46, 
I have a two note idea and then I have a three note idea and I'm alternating two and three notes. And you see I'm continuing up that major scale, two notes, three notes, two notes, all the way up until I decide to end that hemiola, then I resolve down on the major chord. Then looking at the next line, I'm getting sort of an unexpected and uneven rhythm happening. Um, in bars 49 and 50, which I think is kind of a cool thing to do, um, especially after a lot of sequ sequencing and repetition, trying to throw in um, sort of an odd feel. That can be a fun way to spice up a line a little bit. And then over the major chord, I'm including that sharp five sound, which is a really fun sound to use over a major chord. All right, in this next phrase, we're on the bridge here, and I'm using a major sound that resolves to the sharp 11 on the major chord. And then right on that last measure of the bridge, this is a nice line, a nice way to incorporate the flat 13 sound over a dominant chord. All right, looking at this last part of the etude here, um, in bar 62, I'm getting a pretty dissonant sound happening here. I think this is probably the most dissonant part of the entire etude. So this is over the minor chord, but I'm including flat nine, major seven, and flat 13, um, and sharp 11 over this minor chord, which a lot of times we don't hear a lot of those notes over minor chord, but it can be fun to throw them in as long as you can find a way to resolve. So you see then I'm resolving in the next measure, and then eventually, um, in bar 64, I'm getting that resolution on the sharp 11 of the major chord. So then in these last eight bars, I'm sort of shooting for landing notes and places to resolve. And this helps um, give the solo a feeling of closure. So I'm hitting um, the root in bar 67, then I'm hitting a nice sounding note over that diminished, and then I'm hitting that flat seven over the two chord in bar 69, and then sort of slowing down, playing some half notes, and then resolving. All right, so that is it for the analysis of this etude. So what I would suggest, um, you know, you can use this however you want, but one thing you can try is to pick out your favorite spots and just draw out those parts and learn it in all keys. See if you can play those lines over different tunes, manipulate the lines in your own way, change them to make them your own, and really just try to bring in some of this language into your own plane. And if you have any questions, please shoot me an email.